Chinese government always have this kind of paranoia. If you have this identity that you try to protect, and if you are so proud of it, that is a potential threat to its power. The persecution of the Uyghurs by China's government has been documented widely. But are we still paying attention? It began with reports of religious crackdowns in the northern Xinjiang region, targeting the Muslim majority living there, most of whom don't consider themselves ethnically Chinese and belong to their own country, East Turkestan. CCTV cameras were set up outside people's homes, in mosques, in offices, Religious rituals like fasting during Ramadan were banned. If you were seen by colleagues praying during work hours, you could be reported, lose your job, or worse. Then people began disappearing. At first, mostly men from their homes and workplaces, detained on vague charges and sometimes replaced by Chinese security officials who were tasked with keeping tabs on their families and in some instances, living in their homes. Thousands of Uyghurs disappeared this way. And slowly, a bigger picture began to form for what was really going on. Large prison camps were being built to house more than a million detainees, in what China calls re-education camps, but what human rights groups label as concentration camps, designed to force the Muslims to give up their religious beliefs and instead adopt a stronger loyalty to the Chinese state. China, of course, denies this, as well as allegations of torture and forced labor, and says it's simply cracking down on religious extremism. Initially, the international community seemed to be speaking in a unified voice against this. But over time, many countries started softening their stances against China in favor of trade relations and investment opportunities. So, who stands with the Uyghurs today? Welcome to The Big Picture, a show about the past, the present, and the future. My name is Mohammed Hassan, and today we are joined by Rahim Mahmoud, uh, the UK Director of the World Uyghur Congress. Rahima, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. So I want to talk to you about the Uyghur situation, but I want to begin by talking about who the Uyghurs are, what East Turkestan is, which is the name that Uyghurs identify with, as opposed to the Xinjiang region. So who are they? So Uyghur people, we are Turkic. Um, so Turks actually traveled from the Turkestan, east and west, the, uh, throughout the Altai region. So we are Turks, original Turks, we call ourselves. So our language is Uyghur, which is very similar to Uzbek language. The closest Turkic language is Uzbek language. And uh, um, the place where we are is in the heart of Central Asia. Uh, we prefer to call it East Turkestan, not only because of the political uh, uh, background, but also the geopolitical or the geographical location. It's the Turkestan, as you know, is a land of Turkic people. And where we are is the east side. And uh, th therefore, we call, we prefer to call it East Turkestan. And Uyghurs have lived in Turkestan uh, throughout Central Asia, um, you know, from the time we know ourselves as Uyghur or as Turks. Um, so we are the uh, native people of that land. Um, the Chinese government calls the place Xinjiang and also say that it's a historical part of China. But Xinjiang means new territory or new frontier. Uh, that the name came after the Qing dynasty. During the Qing dynasty, it was occupied. The, the, it was colonized by the Qing uh, army. And I will say approximately 200 years of that uh, colonial history. And uh, as Uyghurs, like many other uh, people, we feel ashamed being colonized and our land being taken away from us. And therefore, um, majority Uyghurs uh, don't like the name Xinjiang because Xinjiang just remind you that you are people oppressed under the 
Chinese government. So this current Chinese regime, I mean, really, for the last maybe 50 years, has been undergoing this project to um, to create this singular Chinese identity, ethnicity, right the way uh, through, you know, we've seen it happen previously in Taiwan, but certainly in Hong Kong and a lot of other areas. Uh, what has the relationship between the Uyghurs and the Chinese government been like? So from the time the uh, the Communist Party, Communist government in 1949 took over, became the governor, um, after we had a brief uh, independence from 44 uh, East Turkestan Republic, um, the aim was very, very clear. It's convert the, the people, become Han. Although in 1955, um, in order to ke- keep peaceful kind of resolution, because at that time, ethnic army was still exist, and uh, the Chinese Communist government uh, agreed to uh, name the place and give the full autonomy to the Uyghur people, so that uh, called Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. And under the autonomy uh, constitution law that Uyghurs as language, religion, cultural tradition, everything is protected. And they said, we are here just to help you to develop the region. Uh, we are not here to try to uh, change you. But then again, from 1958, the rightist movement started throughout China, um, targeting the cultural figures, writers, and then followed by the Cultural Revolution. I'm sure you heard about the Cultural Revolution, how many millions of Chinese, Tibetan, Uyghurs died during the purge, and also so-called famine. Um, so during the Cultural Revolution, um, religious freedom, there, there was no religious freedom. So people were not allowed to uh, practice any kind of religion. So, so if you agree with a communist government, then you should just believe communism. You shouldn't believe the existence of God. And therefore, the, all the mosques uh, were closed down, some were demolished. So when I was little, when my uh, parents and my elder brothers and sisters, when they prayed, they often told younger ones, us, don't, don't go out to tell, tell people we prayed. They would lock the gate from inside and pray. Um, I was very young then, and later I learned that was the latter years of the Cultural Revolution. And then uh, in 1976, Mao died, and then the situation changed. New leadership, um, branded Cultural Revolution was wrong. Although they didn't say it was Mao who made the mistake, they, you know, uh, obviously found some scapegoats to say that they are the, the uh, people who are behind confusing uh, Mao at his old age. Anyway, from the early 80s, the mosques reopened. So the situation changed. Uh, changed. So I remember my father became um, uh, an imam, a local mosque. People were happy. And many uh, Uyghurs who were imprisoned during the Cultural Revolution um, in early 60s, uh, they returned. That was the early 80s, so after 20 years. So some, some young men, I remember my parents used to say, Oh, when he was uh, arrested, he was only 18 now. Look, he is uh, like, a, um, like an old man, came back like an old man. So I have those vivid memories uh, from childhood that, you know, the prisoners returned from labor camps and prisons. But there is this kind of joy and happiness. Um, we had uh, this music and concerts, uh, just like a self um, kind of gathered uh, spontaneously, uh, you know, celebrating the return of someone from from prison, and um, up until 1989, 
um, the students' uh, democratic movement uh, in Beijing. I was there, by the way. Um, I was at the university, Italian University of Technology, uh, doing petrochemical engineering degree. I traveled with about 2,000 students from Dalian, 21 hours train journey to Beijing to join the, that democratic movement. Wow. Um, so uh, the reason I mentioned this because this was also another turning point from this very joyful and uh, feeling that their changes are coming, uh, hoping that the, this one party system will change um, after the uh, Cultural Revolution was branded as uh, illegal, was wrong, um, and we thought that kind of new uh, changes, democracy, um, freedom, freedom of assembly, speech, and, uh, you know, millions of students participated in the end, ended with the June 4th massacre. Um, I left the square on the 2nd of June after repeatedly uh, being warned that military are uh, standing out, outskirts of Beijing will be coming. And the organizer of uh, our uh, university uh, warned us that we must leave, otherwise we would be trapped in Beijing. Mm -hmm. So we left just in time to get back to university. And, uh, and that event actually kind of shaped my view and uh, my um, activism and uh, my deeper understanding of the Communist Party, um, the brutality, um, they could even open fire on the most brilliant students who demanded change for the country. So let alone for Uyghur people, since then, from the early 90s, situation became extremely difficult mm -hmm. uh, for Uyghurs, for Tibetans. Whenever there is this kind of political purge or crackdown, and the, the, the regions like uh, uh, Uyghur region or East Turkestan, because they consider it as a problematic, troublesome region. Mm -hmm. So they, they crack down more, they implement more uh, policies to control and to arrest and to intimidate people. So uh, that is how the things changed. Um, when I graduated from university in 1992 with this uh, top degree, petrochemical engineering, I spoke fluent Chinese because from primary school I went to Chinese school and I spoke English as well, I cannot find a job in, in the capital of Urumqi. Um, so the root cause of the problems um, in the region, uh, because people always only hear the news talking about, you know, there is uprise or there is separatist movement or even called terrorists, is because of the Uyghurs were treated so differently. From the time, 1949, um, I'm not going to talk about the nationalist government. Of course, it was also as brutal. But the, the since the uh, communist government invaded and took over, the Uyghurs were always being treated like second-class citizens, even though it was um, promised that it's an autonomous region, the Uyghur has the autonomy, um, but that was never honored. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we are facing genocide. So you mentioned, you know, the Tiananmen Square massacre. This was one of the turning points, I think, from a global perspective um, about what was happening in China on the ground. And one of the things that marked that event is the way that the government controlled the information that came out of it, the reports, eyewitnesses. It, I mean, to this day, um, it's it's uh, you know it's illegal to mar to mark that event to, to 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 gather in any way. And one of the similarly, one of the biggest issues of the persecution of Uyghurs is how little information the world had access to for a very long time. 
How difficult was it for people in that region trying to communicate with the world to get their story out? And what were the consequences of doing so? I wouldn't even compare the situation, you know, in uh, the the Tiananmen Square situation because it's it was in Beijing, mm. and uh, the world eyes were there. We had BBC reporters and many, but in my country, you don't have those um, privileges. So everything is completely kind of covered up. People cries, but. People cannot see, uh, the world cannot see those tears. Um, when the war started in Ukraine and, you know, after witnessing such long uh, war in Syria, you know, when you see the graphic image of the situation, you become so touched. You want to do something about it. The tragedy of what is happening to Uyghurs, to my people, is that the world cannot see it. Mm. You know, only after when the number one million mentioned by the UN report in August 2018 is that up to one million Uyghurs illegally incarcerated. Then reporters started to like wake up or want to do a story about it. And that's something that as an activist, we find it extremely difficult. But luckily, uh, we had this satellite image of these camps and, and uh, just pure by luck, the drone footage of blindfolded men and these transfers were happening almost daily. We, we heard from uh, people from inside sending out messages, but we cannot prove those messages. But only after that drone footage was shown, then people could see the similarity of the Holocaust, what was happening to, to, to innocent Uyghur people. And... Uh, um, Sometimes I just find it very difficult to even convince people when people ask me, is that true? I just feel so upset. Mm. Because I was think I just think that how you still doubt about it? Why you think it is not true? Why do you think that is? Why do you think people have such a hard time believing what's happening over there? First of all, I think people don't really pay attention to, because the news is not like everyday news. Like when Ukraine war, you see on the television, you cannot avoid not seeing it. It's all the channels are covering this news. But for Uyghur situation is every time when there is some information, when they obtain some kind of information, drone footage, or um, leak, you know, a classified document leak, or the like Xinjiang police file that only um, last year that came out, thousands of photographs of uh, people, uh, those detained uh, people, their photos. It's very, very rare. The, the news coverage is not a lot, not enough. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons and another reason is because the Chinese government's this the disinformation campaign, um, completely denying that you know, and they produce so many fake um, documentaries, news reports, and uh, the um, news about how Uyghurs were all happy. They interview them, obviously, you know, um, they cannot tell the truth. The, the singing and dancing, praising the the, the the communist government that we we have much better life. We have more mosques than any other Muslim countries and things like you know information like this do confuse 
people. To begin with, most Western reports suggest people inside these education centers could be there indefinitely. Now, local officials said the vast majority of the attendees have actually picked up a skill, completed the program, and went home. Rukia Yakup spent 10 months in the education center. While there, she perfected her Mandarin skills and studied sales. There's been some videos on the internet going viral saying that you have been missing. If you only watch the media that's coming out of China, you see this completely different landscape of what's happening over there. Um, at times, it's kind of eerie to, to, to watch something like this where there is not only, I mean, there has now been an acknowledgement of from the Chinese government that these detention camps exist. Um, they're calling them, quote unquote, re-education camps. And they're saying that, you know, people are going in to learn crafts and, and uh, learn the Chinese language and Chinese values. It is almost a parallel universe to what you are describing, to what other Uyghurs ha are describing, what's happening to them, what's happening to their relatives. What is the m feeling and the mood like in your country now, on the ground, day to day? What does it feel like to live there? In prison, largest open air prison. I left my country in 2000. 23 years in exile, I couldn't return. When I was diagnosed with grade three cancer in 2013, none of my siblings can obtain a passport to come to visit me, despite the oncologist wrote a really moving letter uh, saying that there is chance I may not survive, and it is important that someone be with me. And since 2017, in uh, January, that's the last time when I spoke to my eldest brother. After October 2016, uh, none of my siblings answer my phone call. I, have, I had nine siblings I left behind. My mother died in 2013 while I was fighting cancer. So for two, three months, I cannot reach anyone. And I heard that the crackdown is happening. People are disappearing. So every time when I call my sister, my brother, or their children, when no one answered my call, I was just, I didn't know how to, how to react. It was just so painful and so the worry that when you cannot reach, when you cannot find the news. And then finally in January 2017, after repeatedly called my, my eldest brother, who's like my father to, to me, and he answered the call. Um, normally in my family, because of this, my father is a very religious man. Um, from young age, we greet people, um, assalamu alaikum. And my brother answered the phone, way. Is that, that's the Chinese way, I answer, answer phone call, way, hi. And at that time, actually, I did hear people say that assalamu alaikum was banned. And I didn't believe, I thought, can't be, because that's the everyday word that we use back home. It's just like, a, I mean, it's instinct, how are you? Right? Yeah. yeah, it's just like, a, how are you? And uh, I was quite taken back when I heard my brother said, why? And then I said, why no one is answering my phone call? He said they did the right thing. And quietly, and that it was really shaky voice, said, leave us in God's hands. He put the phone down. And that's the last time I spoke to, you know, anyone from my family. And I was completely cut off. And I knew that if I actively reach out to anyone, I would put them at risk. Because later, a lot of um, leaked files that showed that the, the reason of these people detained had 
um, family members living abroad or had a phone call with, with someone in abroad or send money to their children abroad. Those became crime and they, those became the reasons why they are taken into these torture camps. And uh, after six and a half years, I learned that my eldest sister died uh, in March. And I cannot call anyone to just, you know, find more information or to grieve over the phone even. And I learned my eldest brother was in these camps for over two years and released because of poor health. And I, apart from that, I don't know anything. This is also pure luck. Someone who knows my family gave me past this information. So this is a situation. People over there, they dare not to speak to one another. Um, when we interviewed one uh, high-tech engineer who at the time who left the region two weeks prior to that interview, he was in um, detention center for uh, about over one month. And uh, it revealed that, you know, a knock on the door makes your heart jump because you just think police came to take me. Because in the past, if people involved in any kind of um, Uh, religious activities or, uh, you know, they kind of guess that maybe because I did this that, you know, they are cracking, cracking down on religion and therefore. But from 2016, especially 2017, you don't have to have reason to be arrested. And uh, a lot of arrests were made through the IJOP system, Integrated Joint Operation Platform, that is through the computer collecting information of your movement. Mm. And then computer automatically um, produce the names of people uh, in green, yellow, red color. Green is normal, yellow is suspicious, red is dangerous. Mm. So it's not even assessed directly by human beings. It's the computer system that they how they um, input and they then make sure that there is reason they, 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 they arrest people. And this is connected to people's, you know, uh, ability to move to uh, into public transport, from what I understand it, to travel, bank accounts. It's, it's a system that China's building that is kind of integrating all of these different things and automating a lot of how it governs people. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, especially for Uyghurs in 2016, they collected biodata, forced everyone to go uh, provide uh, DNA, um, fingerprints, iris scans, facial scans, voice recognition. So when Uyghurs go to mainland China, when they pass this um, facial recognition cameras, it uh, scream alarm goes off and then immediately they are stopped. They have to wait until a police come and then check them, interrogate them. It's happening now as well. So it's a racial profiling of a group that they deemed to be potentially dangerous. That's how the, the, the whole Uyghurs are living under this regime at the moment. Regardless, you are in, taken into camps or living in your, in, in your own home. And you might have heard about how they um, uh, appoint the cadres to go and live with the Uyghurs at least one week a month to monitor their lifestyle. Uh, whether they have religious books in the in the house, whether they speak Uyghur language or the Chinese, and uh, also having conversation with children, because children are innocent, they can give away a lot of a lot of information, 
and then through that to to to, to arrest more. This is a terrifying existence that you're describing. How is it that there isn't more global attention, more global focus on what's happening, and why isn't the Chinese government being held to account? As you know, Chinese government now is the one of the most uh, biggest biggest power in the world. One of five UN uh, security council security members. council member. You know, one of the five UN security council members alongside Russia. Also the economy, because over the years they made many countries depend on China. So this economic dependencies and every country tried to protect, protect their own benefits. Um, and that is the kind of card, important card that China is holding against the countries many, many countries, including Turkey. Um, I'm not going to mention about Muslim countries. It makes my blood boil when I think about it because those countries not only not condemning, uh, not even like just staying silent, you know, not vote, not say anything, but they're voting for the Chinese government. And for example, recent uh, visit by Mahmoud Abbas. Abbas, yeah, the Palestinian, the Palestinian president. leader. So speaking about Muslim countries, and, and we can touch on it briefly because, as as you mentioned, you know, not only have many of these countries um, not spoken out uh, in favor of the Uyghurs and the voices of the Uyghurs. But over the last few years, we've seen a lot of uh, statements in support of China's treatment, specifically of Muslim minorities. Uh, and these statements came from the OIC, the, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. This is the largest body of Muslim countries in the world. How do Uyghurs feel about uh, this coming from fellow Muslim countries? Are they the kinds of voices that you and others expected to be standing alongside you in this fight? Total betrayal. Because one of the reasons why Chinese government targeting Uyghur people compared to many other ethnic groups, any other religious groups, because we are Muslim. The Uyghurs were branded as Islamic terrorists. And the I won't call it Islamophobia because Islamophobia is a very light term because Uyghurs paying extremely high price for being Muslim, for practicing Islam, for holding a Quran in the house, for refusing to denounce Islam. Women are raped. I've translated for some survivors, and Tursnaizi Abudun bravely gave evidence at the Uyghur Tribunal, and also the BBC report about this systematic gang rape that is happening. All the survivors that I know, that I have translated for, they all have the story that is very much related to religion, because they have to every uh, class, every time when they finish the class, before they leave the, 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 the class, they must say, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Allah. And yet these Muslim countries supporting Xi Jinping's regime. I don't know how we can call that, call them Muslim. It's betrayal, the very basic value of Islam. And I often wonder whether they actually represent 
the people, those millions and billions of Muslims. I wonder why those people not speaking up. You know, okay, if the governments are, you know, in line with the with the Chinese government for many different reasons, economy, diplomatic relationships, and so on, and many signed trade agreements that they were already, um, you know, they have to oblige to remain silent. What about people? What do you think China is trying to achieve? China's government always have this kind of paranoia about any kind of groups or uh, nations or people that has a very strong identity who don't consider themselves, especially if you are within China, under their, their control. If you have this identity that you try to protect and if you are so proud of it, that is a potential threat to its power. So for one of the reasons, also very important reason that Chinese government want to completely um, eliminate the Uyghur people, um, if not physically, but at least the um, culture, the language, so make them completely assimilate, become Han Chinese, because they feel that unless the Uyghurs all become like Han Chinese, and there is a threat, because they want to be to um, lead life that what they want. It's uh, very different from the Chinese Han majority lifestyle. And that they consider that itself is a threat. That's why they want to completely assimilate Uyghur people. Now the uh, Uyghur uh, schools closed down. All the Uyghur teachers who used to teach in Uyghur language made redundant. Um, kids from uh, nursery, they're not allowed to speak Uyghur language. And uh, so when you cannot speak the language, then when you will not um, have any access to uh, the cultural and religious education, you become just another person. You know, that's what they want to achieve. Not only just Uyghur, for example, like Tibetans. The reason Tibetans are also heavily uh, persecuted it's the same reason, although they are not Muslim because they have yeah, they, they have religious beliefs and also they have their own identity, their own language, their own culture, very, very different from the majority Han. of the Uyghurs outside, the ones who have escaped, the ones who are living in exile like yourself, thousands of people essentially trying to find sanctuaries, places of safety, trying to reach their families. What is the situation for, for those on the outside? Sad. When we get together, sometimes we try to avoid even talk about it because it's everyone's stories is just heartbreaking and one is worse than the other. For example, Dulkan Issa, the World Over Congress uh, president, his mother died in the camp seven, at the seven, age of 78. He knows two brothers, one mathematic professor in long, long term, serving long term prison sentence. And the last year or year before, we learned that his youngest brother 
serving life prison sentence simply because of his activism in exile. And I told you about my, my story. And we have many Uyghurs. We, had some, we have some families in this country heard family members died in camp. They dare not to speak about it because they fear that other members might, you know, suffer the same if they did. So it is a very difficult situation. Um, but we try not to just become so uh, depressed and, and lose hope. Uh, we try to still build kind of new uh, community, uh, cultural um, gatherings. Um, we have like Uyghur schools in a lot of countries where we send the children to to learn Uyghur language. So um, actually the, the awareness, the Uyghurs living in exile becoming more kind of urgent. We feel the urgency that it's us that we can um, preserve our culture because we have the opportunity and we are not um, being targeted. We have that freedom, for example, in Turkey, in this country, in the US, in Australia, uh, wherever there is a large Uyghur community, people are trying to kind of basically um, hold on to, you know, have this, um, to make sure that we preserve the language, the culture, music, art. Um, and you're a shining example of this as, as a musician and, and as a singer. Um, we're speaking today and you, you mentioned that you have two concerts coming up in the next week. Tell me about your connection to music uh, and, and what that means to you to practice this part of your culture uh, so far away from home. How does that, for you, kind of present a part of preserving your identity? Yeah, it's like uh, I when I speak my own language, because uh, I remember my mother said that from the time I started speaking, I was singing. Uh, I'm, I came from that background, my mother's side. My mother sang very beautifully and played a dutar, um, not in public, always at home. And uh, so my grandfather was also quite known a uh, musician and singer, my uncles and my brothers. So I grew up in that kind of environment, uh, partly very religious uh, my father from my father and then my mother's side they were all uh, uh, musicians and it is like a, it's my soul you know when I sing uh, Uyghur song I close my eyes I travel I travel those hills the valleys the orchards and the, the gardens and the you know the rivers so th those are the kind of places where we had a lot of kind of gatherings and then just s singing um, parties. Um, that is extremely important. The reason, I, you know, a lot of people ask me how you cope, you know, not being able to contact your family and uh, after surviving cancer. And it, I mean, it's hard life uh, here. And uh, I still smile and I still sing and uh, I look more happy than many, <laughs> many people, uh, you know, who are privileged to have so much in life. I think the music plays a very, very important part. Um, and uh, it's also, it became a tool for the resistance and uh, also to, um, through art and music, to raise awareness, because when you talk about atrocities, a lot of people try to avoid listen to something too terrible. But when you start singing, you attract them. People just walk towards the, 
the sound, you know, not knowingly, because the music has no, you know, barrier. We, you can just cross border. You can just through the melody, you can understand uh, the feeling of that person, whether sad, whether happy, uh, all, all. And therefore, it is extremely important. First of all, it's for my own uh, well-being. And uh, secondly, it's very important for my activism, for my work. And the reason I have a lot of followers, a lot actually followed me uh, soon after I took on a UK director um, position. And then I founded, co-founded the Stop Uyghur Genocide campaign. Um, also because, you know, they've been to my concerts and they, they know me as a singer. And that actually helped me to build more kind of coalitions and supporters and people. So the um, a lot of my concerts is uh, all, all has a theme, uh, for example, either giving voice to the artists that imprisoned for because of uh, their work or their poems because what they wrote. Um, for example, the uh, next next week concert that on the 27th of June, uh, organized by the Index on Censorship, the theme is uh, banned by Beijing. So, uh, you know, the artists' work, cartoonists, painters, um, singers, uh, activists, uh, you know, how they're not physically banned from, from returning home. But also, you always have these obstacles when you try to do exhibition. For example, Badiou Cao, uh, who is one of the most prominent and well-known cartoonist, uh, cartoonists. And he, his many exhibitions was cancelled worldwide because of the power, the Chinese government's power. And therefore, this event is to promote to tell the story through music and through their work. Uh, you know, this is a reality. You know, we are just a bunch of artists. We just want to f to be free to share our view. You know, in through art, through music, and through poetry. But even that is something that the Beijing threatened, feel terrified. And uh, um, so there's another concert, which is um, on the 14th of uh, July at St. Giles. The title is called To Rahila and Honor My, Honor the Uyghur People. That concert is to memor, it's for specifically for my sister. Uh, Rahila is my eldest sister, who I learned died in March. I feel it's one of the best ways to honor her is through also music, because some of the songs that I learned in my childhood was from her. She also, she was a teacher. She uh, was a head teacher all her life until she retired about 10 years ago. And... Uh, um, and she also had this very beautiful voice. Although she didn't, like, I didn't take singing as my career. And she, also she was worked as a teacher, but she always um, played music and sang uh, when she had uh, friends and had a party. Um, therefore, I thought it's one of the ways to honor and to remember um, my sister, and also through that story uh, to make people aware of the tragedies that is happening. It's not far away. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people amongst you, like myself, that, you know, being affected and suffering, and still we are holding on to hopes that one day things can change for better. 
But in order for things to get changed for better, we need more people to speak up and to take action. Thank you very much for that. It's really incredible um, and profound to hear you speak about your music that way uh, as a tool to bring people together so that they can open their ears and, and listen. Uh, maybe people that have trouble doing that, opening themselves up to something that might be difficult. And that music being this kind of drawing card for people, I think there's a lot to be learned in that. I really want to thank you for being with us today and for sharing your story. It was important for us to listen to it, and I hope that we do continue to listen. Thank you for having me. Thank you for watching this important episode of The Big Picture, and thank you to Rahima Mahmoud for sharing her powerful and deeply personal testimonies. If you'd like to keep up with what's happening with the situation and those trying to raise awareness of it, you can follow her work and the work of the World Uyghur Congress. They are now calling for boycotts against goods that are suspected to be made in these labor camps that we've been talking about. Please share your thoughts with us in the comments below. And if you found this episode informative, please consider sharing it with your network and subscribing to our other episodes. You can find this and all of our episodes on our podcast platforms where you can subscribe there as well. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And until next time, salam.